Hello everybody, thank you for attending my talk. Today I'm going to be talking about mortality and recruitment in largemouth bass, bluegill, and black crappie at the Emaquan Preserve. So a little bit about the Emaquan Preserve. It is a restored backwater of the Illinois River, purchased and owned by the Nature Conservancy. Historically speaking, this area was a highly productive backwater of the Illinois River until it was levied off and drained to be used for agricultural purposes until 2000 when the Nature Conservancy purchased this property. They then began restoration in 2007. The Illinois River Biological Station staff, or IRBS, has been monitoring fish populations since 2007. So over the first two years of restor restoration, the Nature Conservancy partnered with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and stocked in an initial 36 fish species, many of which are pictured on this slide, including the star-headed top minnow, which is state-threatened. The Amaquan Preserve remains an excellent fish habitat and has a strong sport fishery. We see this by looking at largemouth bass, CPUE, or catch per unit effort. This graph is depicting just that from 2007 till 2020. With Emaquan as the green line, pool 13 of the Mississippi River in yellow, which is also known to have a good, good fish habitat. And pool 26 of the Mississippi River in red, and the Lagrange Reach of the Illinois River in blue, both of which are known to have less favorable fish habitat. So as I mentioned, the, the Emaquan Preserve is levied off from the Illinois River. However, in 2013, the Illinois River experienced a large flooding event, which overtopped the levee. It is believed that this is when some riverines, riverine species that were not initially stocked, as well as non-native and invasive fish, were able to enter the Emaquan Preserve. In 2016, the Nature Conservancy built the water control structure to allow them to better manage the Emaquan Preserve. So as I mentioned, the water control structure allows the Nature Cons Conservancy to manage the water levels in the Emaquan Preserve. This allows them to mimic high and low water years uh, to better allow for soil compaction as well as to manage for vegetation and for waterfowl migration. These pictures are just depicting the difference between a normal to high water year versus a low water year or during a year that we're doing a drawdown. So we know that Emaquan has good sport fishery. We know that Emaquan has good fish habitat. What we don't know is how management activities and environmental factors are affecting the fish population. So my study is going to determine just that. So looking at largemouth bass, bluegill, and black crappie otoliths and catch data, I am going to determine what factors are affecting biochronology or annual growth, mortality and individual growth, and year class trends. Today, I'm only talking about mortality and individual growth and year class strength. Sampling occurred from April 1st until May 31st. This was the plan, at least in 2020. This plan was thrown off, but the plan was to sample from the 1st of April until May 31st. The idea here is that this is when these three fish species are moving around and starting to spawn, and so they're a bit more active. This is also the point when one year of growth has ended, but the next year hasn't quite begun. And so when we're looking at our otoliths, we can count all the way to the edge without worrying about a partial ring. So some of the field methods I use for this project include boat DC electrofishing, fike nets, mini fike nets, and tandem fike net sets. These gears are all used in the general monitoring program. They are also the best methods to use when trying to catch and chart it. 
and I have examples of some of these gears on this slide, including what one of our electrofishing boats look like, and then mini fights and uh, fike nets. A tandem fike net set is just two of the large fike nets tied together and ran parallel with the shore. So I collect. I collected 10 fish from each 10 millimeter increment bin. This is to, to gather a good representation of sizes and ages. So once fish were collected, they were then brought back to the lab and otoliths are then extracted. I have a total of approximately 1,088 otolith samples collected from 2010, 2015, 16, 2020, and 2021. Now, I will say I haven't talked about the previous years from 16 to 2010 yet. So those odalis were collected for previous projects done on these species. Um, at this point, I am attempting to utilize those odalis for the biochronology section of my thesis but they will not be utilized for the mortality or year class strength as they were collected under different parameters. So once the otoliths are removed, they can then be embedded in epoxy. So I use an epoxy mixture and let it sit for approximately 24 hours to harden. Once it's hardened, the otolith can be popped out of the little molds you can see on the screen and then sectioned. So I sectioned my otolith using a Bueller low speed saw and a double blade method. So this double blade method is essentially when you're setting the saw blades up, you put one saw blade on and then a thin plastic spacer and then a second saw blade. This allows you to get a saw blade on either side of the nucleus to get the best possible section. And then you're only making the one cut. Um, I will mention that the two pictures on the above right are what the otoliths look like when you pop them out of the molds. And you can see that I've drawn a thin pencil line through the one so this is just to give me a guide on where to put the blades in comparison to the nucleus. So once the otoliths are sectioned, they can then be aged, measured, and photographed using Leica software and a dissecting scope with camera. So this otolith image here is just showing you kind of what I look at. And so I use the measuring tool in Leica to start at the nucleus and then measure from the nucleus to the first ring, first ring, second, and so on and so forth. These measurements are again used for the biochronology portion of my thesis, um, but the aging will be used for mortality and year class strength as well. And then I wanted to just include some different I wanted to include an otolith section from each fish so that you guys can get kind of an idea of what I'm looking at. So starting at the top, I have a black crappie from 2021 and it is aged at 10 years old. A bluegill from one of the previous, previous projects from 2015, which is aged at six years. And then a largemouth bass otolith collected in 2021, which is aged at 14. So jumping into looking specifically at mortality and individual growth. Okay, so the first thing I had to do was generate an age length key. So age length keys are generated using the aged fish, so the fish I caught in 2020 and 2021, and general, general monitoring data. So as I mentioned, IRBS staff have been monitoring fish populations on MQUAN since 2007. So for this, I looked at 
only 2020 and 2021, which these graphs are only depicting 2020. And so I took all of the fish from the general monitoring data that are the same lengths as the fish I caught um, when sampling for my thesis. And so the fish from the general monitoring data are unaged, while the fish from my thesis are aged. Using RStudio, it then calculates what proportion of aged fish are um, a certain age at a certain length, and then they apply that to the unaged fish. So looking specifically at this largest graph, which is largemouth bass in 2020, the top bar is showing what ages correspond with what color. And then on the y-axis, you have the proportion, and the x-axis, you have total length. So if you look at largemouth bass at 150, all largemouth bass collected at 150 are considered one year old based on this. So once all my fish are aged, I can then use that to calculate total annual mortality rates, which is A, and total instantaneous mortality rates, which is Z, from 2020 and 2021. To calculate mortality, I use catch curves. So the catch curve, so the bottom graphs are catch curves with the best fit lines. I will point out here that the dots that are surrounding the lines are my catch curve residuals, which I will talk about more in the coming slides. So these graphs are depicting the natural log of catch and the estimated ages to determine Z, which is the instantaneous total mortality rate, and A, which is total annual mortality rate. All mortality rates for all three species over both years are listed in the table above. For both years, black crappie and largemouth bass have relatively low mortality rates at around 20%. Based on my literature review, this is lower comparatively while bluegill have much higher mortality rates compared to my literature review at 78% in 2020 and 62% in 2021. More analysis is being done to determine why this is. Now moving on to looking at year class strength. Okay, so looking at year class strength, we use those residuals I talked about on the catch curves. I can then create studentized residuals, which are the residuals with a standard deviation of one to help determine what years have strong or weak year classes. So positive residuals have strong year classes. So by that, I mean anything that is at or above that uh, positive one dashed line on each of these graphs for each species, and negative residuals indicate weak year classes, which are anything at or below um, negative one on each of these graphs. Strong year classes are indicated in green, while weak year classes are indicated in red. Um, these graphs are all from 2020 as well. It is, I would like to note that all Three of these species do have strong year classes in 2018, while all of them have weak year classes in 2017. So next I wanted to look at year class strength with some management actions. So the timeline is just depicting certain management activities and environmental activities that have gone on in the history of Emaquan, and you'll notice that the yellow bars or the yellow boxes around those management activities do somewhat correlate with some of the year class strength. One particularly is in 2018, we see strong year classes for all three species, and this is when the first drawdown event occurred. And then in 2016, largemouth bass had a weak year class 
This was also when the lake reached the highest water elevation, like the highest average water elevation. So, and then in 2013, largemouth bass also experienced a strong year class, and this is when the levee overtopped. So there's potential that there's some overlap between these management and environmental factors and year class strength. Um, I'm going to continue my analysis to determine, to determine exactly what is affecting these fish, though. So then I wanted to look at your class with certain environmental factors. So I took the residuals from the previous graph, graphed them together as lines, and then graphed yearly averages of certain environmental factors over top of them. So I chose Secchi, water temperature, submerged, submerged aquatic vegetation, and water surface elevation. I chose these four factors because based on the literature, they are most likely to have effects on these sport fish populations. So in each of these four graphs, black crappie is in pink, Bluegill is in green and largemouth bass are in blue, while the black line represents the environmental factor. So as you can see at this point, there's not a whole lot of correlations. There is some potential um, correlation between water temperature and water surface elevation, but more analysis is needed. I will also point out that um, each of these environmental variables, I took the yearly average for each year to plot them. So I will break this out a little bit more um, with my coming analysis and do this for each species and look specifically at their growing years and things like that to see if I can't get a better idea of what's going on. So with that, I just want to give you some general conclusions. Overall, for mortality rates, largemouth bass and black crappie have lower mortality rates compared to my literature, whereas bluegill mortality rates in Emiquan is much higher than the rates given in my literature. Um, all species had strong year classes in 2018, while all species had weak year classes in 2017. So there are some potential overlaps between year class strength, management activities, and environmental variables. With that, I would like to thank everybody that has helped me on this, on this project, including all of IRBS staff and technicians, Ford's Biological Station for providing vegetation data, the Nature Conservancy, and University of Illinois Springfield for allowing me to do this research. And with that, I will take any questions if I have time, or you can feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you.